Neighbours Godspeed, welcome to Sonnet Sisters. My name is Anna and today I will be examining sonnet number 29. What was he all about? That body mister, come figure it out with the Sonnet Sisters. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy contented least, yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, haply I think on thee and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. What is the meaning of this? On first impression, this sonnet is a bit sad. It's very lonely. The uh, speaker is experiencing a lot of uh, self-hate. He does say, almost hating myself, but I think he's already there. The rhythm is broken, we have two feminine endings where we have an extra syllable at the end kind of leading us off the edge of the cliff with a bit of a drop at the end, so we're left feeling like this sonnet is not particularly pretty. It's a bit awkward, ugly, it represents how the speaker is feeling about themselves. The speaker talks about his state only in relation to others, and that's kind of sad because if you compare yourself to others you're always going to fail somewhere. The tone enforces this odd victim-blaming culture in which the poor or unlucky deserve those things. They are sinners, they are morally corrupt in some way and that's their destiny and they can't change that in any way. So they're both to blame but it is also out of their hands. When the message turns around in the final couplet, lifting the speaker up in spirits with the use of remembering his love, is kind of a tired message by this point if you're reading the sonnets in order. I would encourage anybody not to read the sonnets in order, by the way. But if you're coming to the sonnet afresh, it's quite a sweet sentiment. Your love, when I think of it, lifts me completely out of my depression and up to heaven. My spirits are in the sky. Aww. Let's look at the meanings of a few specific words and phrases. In disgrace here means out of favour, so out of favour translates as a slightly less damning phrase, however I think in disgrace these days kind of does translate to out of favour in those days, so the weight of it is still as it feels when you read it, I think. Beweep means to weep about. It's an old way of saying to weep about. I think the only words that we really use today that are similar are bemoan and begrudge. You still might bemoan having to work late and not being paid extra, or you might begrudge somebody taking the last sweet in the pack. Bootless is a great word and it means useless or futile, so bootless cries are futile cries. Art here means skill, so that man's art is the skill that that guy can do very well. Scope means freedom, and I really love that, that partnership of words. Haply, quite expectedly, means perhaps, by good chance, and it plays on happily as well. State could refer to the speaker's state of mind, it could also refer to their estate, or their status, so could do with wealth and property and also social standing. Sullen means dark and melancholy, and I quite like that the modern connotations of sullen give the earth this anthropomorphised sense of moodiness. Change just means exchange or swap. Enjoy might just mean enjoy, it might also mean possess, which was a more common usage of the word back then. So with what I most enjoy contented least, what I most enjoy might be what I have most of, or it might be what I usually enjoy the most. Themes. We have fortune in the way of luck or money, possession, values, things we value, satisfaction, contentment. 
In terms of imagery, we don't have a wealth of imagery. It's very internally musing, this sonnet, but we do have a few that strike me. There's the crying. There's the crying, not only weeping, but crying out loud to heaven, and heaven either turning its back, ignoring these cries, or not even hearing them. So these cries are completely useless. That's quite a powerful image of um, either God turning his back or these cries just disappearing on their way up to heaven. There's the lark singing at heaven's gate, which is kind of the antithesis of the futile cries to heaven. We have kings, which are kind of such an evocative image in themselves that I wanted to include them here, even though they're really just a mention. I have a few questions. Why is he disgraced? What did he do? Did he do anything? Is he imagining it? Do we take his word for it? Is he actually crying out to heaven and God is turning his back? Uh, is he actually ignored in society and outcast? Or is he imagining this? Because it is quite dramatic. I do get the sense that maybe it's a little bit exaggerated. One popular theory is that he's disgraced purely by his association with the theatre, which, as we know, Puritans were not such a fan of um, in those days, so I have a quote for you. Do they not maintain bawdry, insinuate foolery, and renew the remembrance of heathen idolatry? Do they not induce whoredom and uncleanness? Nay, are they not rather plain devourers of maidenly virginity and chastity? For proof whereof, but mark the flocking and running to theatres and curtains, daily and hourly, night and day, time and tide, to see plays and interludes where such wanton gestures, such bawdy speeches, such laughing and fleering, such kissing and bussing, such clipping and culling, such winking and glancing of wanton eyes and the like is used, is wonderful to behold. Then these goodly pageants being ended, every mate sorts to his mate, every one brings another homeward of their way very friendly, and in their secret conclaves, covertly, they play the sodomites, or worse. And these be the fruits of plays and interludes, for the most part. And whereas you say there are good examples to be learnt in them, truly so there are, if you will learn falsehood, if you will learn cousinage, if you will learn to deceive, if you will learn to play the hypocrite, to cog, to lie and falsify, if you will learn to jest, laugh and fleer, to grin, to nod and mow, if you will learn to play the vice, to swear, tear and blaspheme both heaven and earth, if you will learn to become a bored, unclean and to divergenate minds, to deflower honest wives, if you will learn to murder, flay, kill, pick, steal, rob and rove, if you will learn to rebel against princes, to commit treasons, to consume treasures, to practice idleness, to sing and talk of bawdy love and venery, if you will learn to deride, scoff, mock and flout, to flatter and smooth, if you will learn to play the whoremaster, the glutton, drunkard or incestuous person, if you will learn to become proud, haughty and arrogant, and finally, if you will learn to contemn God and all his laws, to care neither for heaven nor hell, and to commit all kinds of sin and mischief, you need to go to no other school for all these good examples may you see painted before your eyes in interludes and plays. <sighs> I feel a bit dragged. Okay. Let's take a chill pill from Elizabethan Puritanism and move on to a modern translation of Sonnet 29. When I'm out of luck and out of favour, I cry, alone, about being an outcast, and I bother God with useless cries he doesn't answer or doesn't hear, and I look at myself and I curse my fate, wishing that I was more like someone with hope, with the good looks of that guy, and the bounteous friends of that guy. I want that man's skills. I want that man's freedom. I'm least satisfied with what I have most of. Or, I'm least satisfied with what I usually enjoy the most. But, even when I'm in this mood, when I almost hate myself, a happy thought of you might come into my mind, and my spirits lift like the voice of a songbird in the morning, from the melancholy earth all the way up to heaven. 
because the memory of your sweet love brings with it such a reward that I would scoff at the idea of changing places with anyone, even with a king. Now, as with translations of any of the sonnets, I feel particularly here that one reading won't do. The way it's written is very particular, and the potential ambiguity of certain words and phrases after, as they've changed over time is important and it's particular, and I think that is where the wealth of reward comes in Shakespeare's works. So I don't want to say that that modern translation is what it means. Obviously this is all interpretation, and if you stopped at every potential ambiguity you would be saying, or I mean this, or I mean this, and I'd like not to put all of that straight into your hand. I'd like for anybody watching this to keep rereading the sonnets and find your own interpretations of each line. So how would one perform this sonnet? Tonally, I still feel a bit weighed down by the pressure of this sadness that permeates throughout. It makes me feel a bit pressured. Um, I think if somebody told me that they were hating themselves and hated their position in life, hated lots of things about the world, and were constantly looking for ways to be other than themselves, be like other people, but they thought of me at some point in the day and they felt uh, heavenly. I think I would treat that with kind of suspicion and caution. Um, it's not really up to one person to make any other person happy, that's impossible. So I feel like these emotions are a little bit immaturely expressed or immaturely processed. Maybe some people like the idea of being the thing that lifts somebody out of a depression, drawing on my modern live experience. This sonnet fills me with a bit of dread. Um, I'm someone who lives with depression and has also been in quite emotionally manipulative relationships before, so this immaturely processed idea of being depressed and being not worth anything and seeking out qualities of other people to, to magpie, um, hating oneself, but then saying to somebody, oh, but then I think of you and my mood lifts to heaven, everything is perfect and beautiful. That's terrifying because it's not possible and it won't last and it's quite a huge pressure to put on any one person. Um, so that's the vibe that I'm feeling. It's quite a uh, an angsty, immature way of expressing a connection with somebody. It doesn't feel like real love, whatever that is deemed to be. I know it's very subjective but it doesn't feel like a mature kind of connection. It feels very distant. A lot of Shakespeare's sonnets feel like they're expressing uh, love and affection for somebody that they don't know very well, and this feels like one of those sonnets. It feels like admiring from afar, um, the speaker is comparing themselves to everybody else. It does smack of uh, instantaneous... Um, shallow gratification and shallow perceptions of people. So that's something I'd like to sit with and we'll see what comes out in the performance next week. Tell me in the comments below what you think of this sonnet, how you might perform it, and I'll see you next week. Until then, rest you merry. As we know, Puritans of the day were not such great fans of theatre, 